We can talk about some of the NFL. Good stuff. evening and welcome to Under the Hood. I'm Eli Carp, host tonight, as usual. It is Wednesday, March 8th, and today with me we have Rock the Barn, Eric, and Happy. We are expecting a guest analyst to call in in just a few minutes, any moment. Uh, Bill Pito, um, MSG studio host, Knicks and Rangers. So when he gets here, we will uh, ask him some questions. But guys, it's almost March Madness time. Um, I'm really excited. It is nearly Selection Sunday, and one week and a day from now, the real stuff starts. Some of the two best days of the year, that Thursday and that Friday, when there are 16 games apiece in a span of 12 hours. Um, so I'm very excited for that. What are you guys looking in particular towards, especially we have a few more days to kind of pick out some teams uh, that we want to really look at and think about in these conference tournaments that we can think about going forward. Let's start with Eric. What are you thinking about? I really want to see uh, Gonzaga because they killed St. Mary's yesterday by 20. Again, St. Mary's number 19 team in the country. So I just want to see how dominant they'll be with the rest of their conference. All right. Happy? Uh, I'm interested to see how the Big 12, like, their teams play out this year because it's been, like, noted in past years. I think, like, two years ago when they were, like, three of them were the three seeds, they all lost on the opening day. So, yeah, teams like Kansas, Oklahoma, not Oklahoma this year, but Kansas and Baylor, like, I want to see if they could actually get out of the first or second round this year and maybe make a run. Rock the barn. Duke, just Duke. In general, I mean, they had a lot of high hopes going into the year. A lot of people saw them doing pretty well, and they've really fallen off and not played well whatsoever. So I'd, it's, it'd be interesting to see how far they can get in the – All right. Yeah, Duke, Duke's an interesting team. I was just talking about them with someone earlier today. Just they were the preseason number one pick. So much talent, but for a ver- variety of reasons – injuries, lack of leadership, Coach K being out. just it, it just hasn't come together for them yet, and they've been very volatile. They've shown signs of greatness, and they've shown real signs of inconsistency at times. So Duke is a team that I really am going to be cautious on. And, Happy, I think you bring up a really good point with the Big 12, how they seem to have monster regular seasons, and then whether they just run into a, a, a really bad upset or they just don't have it come postseason – it, they they really seem to underperform, and I think Kansas is a really safe pick to go far. But Baylor, who started so well early, but has kind of teetered off a little bit, and the last few years has been really a good pick to bet against in the first round for an upset. There, I I really would have a tough time picking them. Yeah. Um. Really, t- to go more than a round or two. Um. But definitely with the Big Twelve, a team that I. I'm going to keep an eye on is Iowa State only because the last few years they've been they had been really good they've been ranked but then they had the last couple of years they lost a lot of their senior class who was really talented George Niang amazing four year player uh, and, and this year it is really um, Monte Morris running the show and he has done a great job and although this team struggled early they are really catching fire at the right time and i think they're they're barely ranked but i think this is a team a really dangerous team especially when the big guy deontay burton plays well that's a whole new dimension to this team and i would not put it past them making it to the say the sweet 16 i really wouldn't pass it, put it past them same deal with minnesota and they're even more off the radar than iowa state they're not ranked but this team is was going through a rebuilding phase, but Richard Pitino has done a really good job with them. And, again, a team that started slow early in the season, but it's now really come together. It's one of the hottest teams in the Big Ten. We'll get a look at them in the Big Ten tournament in the next couple of days, see what they can do. Um, but, but, again, another team might be a little under the radar that I wouldn't be so shocked to see make the Sweet 16 if you're looking for a couple differentiating picks. If you really want to call the differentiating. If you're if you're watching right now, you want to submit your questions, please do so through the comments box. Happy to respond to them. Hopefully, Bill will join us in uh, just a couple seconds. Um, all right, question: uh, Grayson Allen, superstar or jerk? And let's give this to Eric. 
I'd say he's not a superstar, but he he's absolutely a jerk, no question about it. Uh, I think he'll – when he declares the draft, he'll probably go mid to late first round, similar similar to like someone like J.J. Redick, not, uh, kind of a jerk coming out of college, can shoot fairly well. But, uh, yeah, I don't think he's a superstar. Any other differentiating viewpoints on this? No. Right, Byron? He's a, a Duke publicity stunt. Uh, I don't think he has much real talent. Yes, he's a good player. He deserves to be at Duke. Uh, he has the skill. But, I mean, the way Duke has played this year, the way he has played this year, the amount of drama is caused to the team being suspended one game, I just don't think at all to play in the NBA uh, drafted mid-late first round, second second round. He's just not good enough to be a superstar like uh, what I think Buddy Heald was gonna, is going to become or Brendan Ingram or Jalen Brown. Okay. Taken there. Um, so let's keep going on this topic of March Madness. Obviously, last year when you were picking your brackets and forming – all your various teams. There were a few teams that people thought that really they were healthy bets to make it pretty far. But it was such a shock coming off of the season before, two years ago, which was when Kentucky was undefeated, and 95% of people had Kentucky winning the national championship. Typically it isn't like that, but just coming off of that, it's, it's weird adjusting to where there are really a lot of different teams being picked to win. Uh, and this year is more of the same of last year. Again, there's parity, such an overused word, but how else do you really want to describe college basketball? Volatile, maybe, but, I mean, this season it's been – there's really no clear-cut team that rises above the rest. I happen to think that Kansas once again has a strong showing uh, and a real chance to make it the Final Four. They did last year before Villanova really came out and, and snatched it, but – Again, they, Kansas has their problems as well. Josh Jackson and, and the, uh, the the really stud the stud freshman, but he's having some uh, some publicity issues about um, some crime he may or may not have committed the allegedly, um, and now he's suspended for the opener, the Kansas opener of the Big Ten tournament. Uh, Kansas is not free of their own problems as well, and obviously Villanova's right there. Thoughts on who we really like to get to Phoenix and possibly hoist the trophy um happy well i mean last year i had michigan state and that completely busted but uh this year um i'm looking at like you said kansas but also north carolina i think the game against duke really showed that they have the potential to move far in games and over on the tournament they almost made it last year as well so i think north carolina yeah yeah north carolina also a very strong option bill is calling in right now so We are going to speak with Bill, Bill P.O., MSG studio host. Hey, Bill, how are you? What's up, what's up? All right, thanks so much for coming on. We are live right now. Um, We have three other panelists who are going to ask you some questions today. Um, So what do you got, five, ten minutes? That's perfect. All right. So uh, first question about the Rangers. Tanner Glass was just called up. What do you make of this move? I know Elaine Vigneault seems to be in love with this guy, even though none of the fans seem to see the value in him. Well, you, you had to look what happened against Columbus and Washington and Montreal, where the Rangers kind of having some issues uh, against some physical teams, and you got the injuries up front to Faust and the injury to Grabner, so... It, it, it turned out to be, so far, in my opinion, a brilliant move. Uh, Glass got into the fight with Tampa, uh, in Tampa, and that kind of spurred the Rangers on. And against Florida, he had his first two-point game since 2014. So I, to this point, I don't know if it's long-term, but I think it's been brilliant. All right. And question coming from one of our panelists, Daniel. Um, How do you feel the uh, – let's let's stick with hockey. How do you feel the Metro – uh, is going to pan out towards the end of the season going into the playoffs. The audio was a little spotty there. Uh, how do you think the Metropolitan Division is going to play out to the end of the regular season? 
Well, you know, it's interesting because you can make the case that the team that finishes is uh, fourth in the division is going to be in better shape in the playoffs taking on Montreal. But I think Montreal's improved here with the acquisitions they made at the trade deadline to get bigger. But, you know, I, I do the AV uh, show with the coach uh, every other week here uh, on MSG, and I'll tell you, they just play to win. And they don't worry about where they're going to end up. They, you have to, when you're a competitive team in pro sports, you cannot back off because use the example in the NFL when teams rest their starters the last week of the regular season then have a bye week they often are terrible in the playoffs so you just have to keep playing play your best and see where it ends up if the Rangers end up opening up against Pitt or Columbus so be it I'll tell you from an organizational standpoint they just want to be playing their best hockey and be healthy when the playoffs start all right Eric your question uh, you working in Madison Square Garden, the house of the Knicks and the Rangers. Uh, the Rangers being a solid franchise, uh, pretty successful right now. And then you got the Knicks. Uh, what is that like to having to have to go really happy with the Rangers and not so much with the Knicks? Now, the Knicks are, are interesting. It's not always in the case uh, where, where it's interesting in terms of wins and losses, but in terms of working around it, it's, it's very interesting because you have all the storylines that, that happen. You know, we really root for them uh, as people that, that work here. Uh, we hope that they turn the corner. We were really optimistic coming into the season. Obviously, it hasn't worked out as well as we all would have hoped. But, you know, going forward, now we're, we, we're tonight, we have the game against the Bucks, and we're going to be watching Chase on Randall. What if, you know, what if Chase on Randall might be the answer here uh, at point guard? Maybe Billy Hernan Gomez and KP are going to be the answers up front. So those are the things we kind of focus on, uh, even when the wins and losses aren't going as well as we all would like. All right, and Happy, your question. Um, uh, I, yeah, so I'm a huge, I don't know, like college fan. I like the little teams and – Obviously, Wichita State was one of them. So I just want to get your thoughts on Ron Baker and his like his contributions to the Knicks this year. Yeah, Jeff Hornacek loves him. Uh, I don't know where he ultimately slots. I, I don't, you know, he's big and physical, but ultimately, I don't know if he's ever going to be more than a role player. I, I think you can make the case that Randall may have more upside. Yeah. I think you may see uh, Randall getting some more minutes, especially uh, given how Randall played against Orlando the other night. I think if Baker can end up being a role player, a backup uh, guard going forward, that, that's probably going to be his future in, in, the, in the NBA. All right, Bill. One one question on the Knicks, and you probably heard this a lot, but just about the triangle. What what do you see as, as the, the answer to the triangle? Do you think that the Knicks have, should keep going forward with it, or should they just ditch it as part of their cleaning the house uh, operation? You know, it's one of Phil Jackson's tenets. The reason that, uh, you know, people talk about how often they're doing it now, the reality is even though they're doing it more, they're still not doing it a majority of the time. But the problem that they've had so much this year is getting back on defense. And the thought is, is that with the trial, we have a more balanced floor and a better chance to get back in transition. So that's one of the reasons for the increased use. It also gives them a defined set to get into after maybe a transition sequence or a fast break sequence breaks down. So... It's just trying to provide some order. Obviously, it's, it seems like it's uh, difficult at times for guys to pick up, but the main reason for going to it here lately is to try to help them in transition defense. Definitely. All right, guys, we got time for one more question. Um, let's go rock the barn. Um, so the Knicks don't really look like they're going to make the playoffs right now. Who knows what's going to happen? Do you have any looking trying to just – get finished off the season as best as possible, or they're looking to the off season, looking who they can get and acquire. So the audio came in a little choppy. I guess it's to tank or not to tank. Yeah. Again, you know, I said about the Rangers, I, I you remember a couple of years ago the, the, under Dirk Fisher, they won a couple of games late and it messed up their chances for the number one overall pick. You know, they won a couple of two of the last three games that year that they won a 17 game. So again, these guys are going to play to win. Uh, the, the hope is, you know, with a deep draft, if they don't make the playoffs, which doesn't seem likely right now, that they're going to get uh, somebody, I guess, a number, a handful of good point guards. That would be a, a great addition, potentially. But, you know, you just don't play the loops. That's not what these guys do. So, hopefully they finish up. they got 26 wins, including tonight, 18 games left. And uh, hopefully they can finish with something to look forward to for next year. 
All right, that's Bill Pito, the MSG studio host. Bill, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Anytime, guys. Good to talk to you. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so that's Bill Pito, MSG uh, studio host. So obviously able to provide some great insight on the Knicks Rangers working um, at Madison Square Garden, being in the ins and outs with the organization. Uh, really able to provide some some great insight. Uh, any other thoughts just on the Knicks and the Rangers from, from you guys, what, what, what you'd like to see going forward, at least as as fans and people who just want to watch the team and see them succeed? I'm going to start with Happy. I think just from, just the, from Knicks the Knicks standpoint, standpoint um, I, think um, I think it's just, just – I think they just need to, just need to find an identity. identity. Like they, I, know, I know the triangle is what they want to do, but I think it's clearly not working, and I think they need a new system, something that could maybe work – but it's just the Knicks are just a – I don't want to – they're just bad, and I just don't know what else to say about them. They just need to find their identity. All right. Uh, Rock the barn? I think from the beginning of this year and coming towards the end of it, Carmelo Anthony is not the answer to any of the Knicks' problems. He's hit a few shots here and there, but Carmelo Anthony, I think, needs to – I mean, it was an option at the trade deadline. I'm assuming they easily could have gotten someone for him not to really do anything. I think I think Carmelo Anthony should not be a Nick next year. All right. And, Eric, do you want to input anything on this, or uh, you'll, uh, you'll stand to the side here? Uh, just a little bit. I think they would really want to build around like Porzingis and Hernan Gomez. Try to find like a legit NBA point guard, not Derrick Rose. Uh, I, I again agree. Get rid of Melo. Try to get something for him. Uh, he'll just, if anything, give you a couple extra wins to hurt your draft lottery. All right. And uh, do you want to talk any any more about uh, March Madness? What what's upcoming? We are have a pretty short show tonight, but we can fit in a couple more minutes of. Uh, whatever we want to talk about. Also, before we go that, the NFL is heating up right now. This is about as dormant as it gets for the league, and yet it's dominating the media. So that, again, speaks to the NFL. Some very interesting moves made, and I'm sure Happy will agree with me. I, I No, I'm sure, but I, there's a good chance Happy agrees with me when I say that the Giants signing of Brendan Marshall, Love it. I think is really good. Love it. Really good. I think that they made the right move releasing Victor Cruz, and they even further validated that move by making a better move to replace Victor Cruz in Brandon Marshall. The knock on Eli Manning is that when he throws off his back foot and when he misses, he misses high. And now that the Giants, they don't have they don't just have receivers under six feet who are fast and can run routes. They have someone who can really go up and out um, and really outman another, another a DB or a linebacker put on him and really go up and out muscle the the guy for the ball, which is something invaluable to this team. Just to essentially, Brandon Marshall is going to be a great safety blanket. And even though he had a terrible season last year, he was a couple hundred yards and a couple touchdowns better than Victor Cruz. And he is going to draw so much more attention off of Odell Beckham Jr. than Victor Cruz did. So when you look, also it's a two-year, twelve million dollar deal. So about six, it's six million dollars a year, and even though he's 30, 32, going to be 33 on the decline, he still can put in good work. And when you see that San Francisco just gave Pierre Garçon $16 million for this year, which is $1 million less than Antonio Brown is getting this year, I think this move looks even better. All right, Happy, you have anything to add to that that I missed or any other giant giant news that you want to say, Hankins-related or anything? No, I think you – covered everything i'm just glad the giants finally got their tall receiver that can help them like you said eli likes to throw high but yeah yeah you said everything and and i'm not sure if you'd agree with me here happy but since they now have more of a pass catching threat is it as crucial to go out and get that number one or number two tight end in the draft or can they maybe wait a round or two and get an offensive or a defensive lineman now here's the thing that relies on if they want to re-sign Hankins and JPP. Because then if they don't want to re-sign one of them, draft that defensive lineman. I don't think it's a particularly strong offensive line draft. So I think if they want – I think they need to improve on an offensive lineman. I know there's some great tackles out there in free agency. So I think that's what they should do. But I, I would perfectly be fine if they drafted like an O.J. Howard or the guy from Miami. 
David and Joko. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Joko. All right, Rocky Barn. Um, it's it's tough to see Brandon Marshall go. I mean, it, it was nice having him for a jet for two years. He played pretty well in 2015. Over here, and you look over there, and you look over me and under me. There's cap space. Now they have so much room to do some QB, get a replacement wide receiver, get some offense. I uh, just think it, and in the end, is a better move for the Jets. Okay. And now, Eric, the Patriots signed Dwayne Allen today. They're also said that it's also been said that um, the Patriots are going to move on from LeGarrette Blunt. Is Dwayne Allen the next mediocre player turned god <laughs> in New England? <laughs> Uh, well, when Bill Belichick calls you the best at his at the position, him and being blocking tight end, I think it'll be pretty good. I don't think he'll put the numbers that Bennett put, but it'll be better than Scott Chandler did the year before. Um, again, he'll be a number two tight end with Gronk. Don't know if he'll be healthy going forward because uh, there's always that risk with him. I think he'll be a solid number two tight end, probably one of like a top five number two tight end. All right, and I think NFL, the, this is the legal tampering period, so you can sign contracts, but it doesn't come official until, I believe, tomorrow at 12 or 3 o'clock Eastern time, one of the two. And then even more big things will even come out with free agency, and it'll be really interesting to see how this Dontari Poe and Jonathan Hankins, con their contract situations turn out, just because I think they're some of the most high-priced free agents on the market right now, and you're always in the demand for a run-stopping defensive lineman, and they are two of the best at their position. The Giants already, I think, in my opinion, have the best at the position. And I think it would be it would be a, a true loss if they did not get one of those guys, at least re-sign Hankins or bring in Poe, uh, although it does not look like they're likely to retain Hankins. Also interesting, does Kirk Cousins end up going to San Francisco? Apparently it seems like there are more and more rumors building around that. Where are we going with that? Um, very interesting. Any other free agents you guys are looking at before we sign off tonight? Uh, Eric. Uh, my, my two top ones are with the Pats, Dante Hightower and Malcolm Butler. You don't win those last two Super Bowls without either of them. It would be very, very, very un um, bad to let them go because Hightower, they signed to a first-round tender yesterday because he was strict to free agent, uh, 3.91 mil. Uh, so the team's going to have to give up a first-round pick to sign him, which I don't think is going to happen, but it could. Um, and then Hightower is a top 10 or 5, wherever you want to play him, linebacker in the league. So it's going to be interesting over the next 24 hours, a little less now, to see what he does, what the Patriots do with them. Definitely. Happy? No, um, I just saw the report, I don't know, with Brian Hoyer going to the Niners. Yep. Yeah, that should be uh, – maybe they're trying to do something. Maybe that means they're going to bring in someone like a Trubisky or someone like that to uh, help them with their quarterback situation, maybe use Hoyer for a year and then probably maybe use Trubisky or Kaiser or Watson. Yeah, and even if they don't – apparently Deshaun Watson had a fantastic combine. I think he's probably yeah. the number, the clear-cut number one on a lot of teams' list at the moment. Um, oh. but, but I think that – Whoever San Francisco brings in, I don't think it has to be a first-rate quarterback, whether it's a young one or a veteran like a Hoyer. But I think that a decent quarterback, even if it's a draft with a few years with Kyle Shanahan, is going to find success just because Kyle Shanahan had success with Brian Hoyer in Cleveland. <laughs> they, Brian Hoyer went 7-6, and six, uh, I think in 2013 or 2014, uh, in Cleveland. Yeah. And that is unbelievable. And Shanahan was the offensive coordinator there. And so you've just seen the success that Shanahan has brought to his quarterbacks. I think that any quarterback working with Kyle Shanahan is going to have a, a good shot in front of them in the next few years to really do something good. Uh, yes, happy. Just a useless fun fact. Brian Hoyer is the only quarterback in the modern Browns history since when they got reintroduced, reintroduced back in the NFL to have a winning record on the Cleveland Browns as a starting quarterback. You know, Brian Hoyer did not throw an interception last year. In four starts, one of them was very short as he got hurt. He threw six inter six touchdowns, uh, a, 
truckload full of yards. And, you know, Brian Hoyer played well last year. I think the people were under undervaluing him for last year's performance, albeit short. Um, any last points to make? March Madness coming up. NFL for agency. Otherwise, we are going to call tonight and see you guys next week. All right. Looks like that's it. So thank you for watching Under the Hood. Really appreciate it. Uh, have a great night. We'll see you back hopefully next Monday. Uh, and we're going to be talking all things March Madness. The bracket will be out at that point. Looking forward to it. All right. Have a great night.